today we're going to be continuing on in Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll, today we'll be covering verses 7 through 14, and I've titled today's message, Redeemed, Forgiven, and Sealed. Last week when we covered the verses 3 to 6, I mentioned a few reasons that Paul originally wrote these verses, verses 3 to all the way to 14, as one long sentence. He did that to trace God's plan of salvation from eternity past, through time, and on to eternity future. He also wrote that in a long sentence, wrote those verses in a long sentence, to establish that God is to be praised for enriching believers with every spiritual benefit for their spiritual well-being. And lastly, I explained that these spiritual benefits are based on the work of the three persons of the Trinity. Those verses that we covered last week, verses 3 to 6, declare the work of selection, the selection of God, of God the Father, in the past. Now, in the passage we're going to be covering today, this week, we're going to continue looking into these spiritual blessings believers have been given through the other two persons of the Trinity, the sacrifice of the Son and the seal of the, of the Holy Spirit. And what I hope that uh, you leave here, when you leave here today, you will leave here motivated, excited. It's going to be, this message is going to be a reminder for all of you of the wonderful spiritual blessings, how rich you are spiritually because of what Christ did on the cross. And so before we begin with reading our passage, let's pray once more and ask God to speak to us through His Word this morning. Heavenly Father, you're so wonderful, you're so good, and you deserve all the praise and honor and glory. We are completely humbled right now to be given the honor to be called children of the Most High God. Lord, may this message Speak powerfully to the hearts of those that are here and those that are listening right now or later on. It will change lives, Lord, change hearts, change directions. It will give listeners a fresh vision of their lives, this world, each other, and to their fellow neighbor. So now we ask that you fill this room with your spirit and we also ask that you speak powerfully now as we sit, continue to sit at your feet and read your word. Thank you again for loving us and blessing us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. The Word of God says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace that He richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of His will according to His good pleasure that He purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ both things in heaven and things on earth in him. As I briefly mentioned earlier, Paul began this long sentence in verse 3 by declaring that born-again believers have been enriched with every spiritual blessing which God the Father demonstrated for the foundation 
of the world when he chose, predestined, and adopted them as sons and, let me add, daughters. Well, now in these verses that we read, Paul now shifts to, from eternity past to now things that happened in our history by introducing the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Some of your translations may say sins. So what I want to do is just look at the three terms that are mentioned here first. Redemption, blood, and the forgiveness of sins. Church, fellow believer, in Christ, believers have been redeemed. Now, one commentator pointed out that words, that words such as redeemer or redemption are often seen as religious terms. But when the man of the first century, when a person from the first century heard them, he immediately thought, in non-religious terms. It brought to mind the common picture of a slave being purchased and then set free. Redemption meant release from bondage by payment of a price. Every Gentile in the Roman world, in the Roman world would have thought of this when he heard that word redemption. Now, the picture in the present context shows our enslavement to sin and release from it. Now, although our own abilities, we might overcome certain sins, our abilities are inadequate for our complete release, rendering us unprepared to stand before the judgment of a holy and perfect God. Guess what? God, in his, in his rich mercy, made payment to set us free from that bondage and thus future judgment. Now, how was that payment made? Through the blood, more specifically, through the blood of Jesus. See, church, God valued us so, high, so highly that the ransom paid to set us free was the blood of his one and only son shed on the cross. Do you know what that means? That means that we are free from the law, free from slavery to sin, as well as free from the power of Satan and the world. So we were slaves We would be poor, but guess what? If you are a born-again believer right now, today, your sons and your daughters, and because of that, you're not poor. You're rich. Now, one of the results of redemption is the forgiveness of our trespasses. Forgiveness, though, is not the same as redemption. Forgiveness is one of its fruits. The term forgiveness means a permanent cancellation or release from the punishment of sin since it's been paid, since it's been paid for by the sacrifice of Christ. Thus, redemption is the cause of our release from punishment, and forgiveness is the effect. Redemption is the cause of our release from punishment, and forgiveness, the effect. You see, God isn't lenient with sin. He has to deal with it severely. And we saw that. We saw the severity of how severe he had to deal with it. How high the cost of redemption was. 
by the supreme sacrifice of His one and only Son. If you're a believer, our redemption and the measure of our forgiveness was accomplished according to the riches of His grace. Paul adds that He richly poured out on us to show that there are no sins too great, too crazy, too wild for God to forgive through the blood of Christ. This has always been the appeal to repentant sinners. Now in the New King James Version, Isaiah chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, the prophet says this, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Did you get that last part? He, God, will abundantly pardon. That, my friends, is rich grace poured out on us. That is rich grace poured out on us. Friends, the measure of God's forgiveness is according to the riches of His grace that He richly poured out on us. Now here, Paul doesn't, doesn't say out of the riches of, riches of His grace, but according to the riches of His grace. Let me give you an illustration of what that kind of looks like. If you go to a multi-millionaire, a billionaire, let's say uh, Elon Musk or, you know, uh, I don't know, one of the most famous or well-known four or five hundred billionaires, and ask for a contribution for a worthy cause, and he gives you one hundred dollars, he has given out of his riches. But if he hands you a blank check and says, fill in whatever you want, fill in whatever you need, the amount to whomever you want, fill it out to whoever, whatever you need, he has given according to his riches. Now, in some translations, the word lavished in verse 8 can best be illustrated by ocean waves. Ocean waves. They just keep coming and coming. God's forgiveness is like that for those who are redeemed through the blood of Jesus. They just keep coming. They never stop. If you've trusted in Christ as your sin bearer or your Redeemer. Paul wants you to experience the extravagant, lavish, undeserved favor of God in forgiving all your sins. It was in grace that He chose us, predestined us, and redeemed us. But that's not all. Paul then says at the end of verse 8 that God has superabounded in that same grace toward us all, toward us, toward us in all wisdom and understanding. Now, we don't naturally think that wisdom and understanding relate to redemption and forgiveness. But without a right understanding of the cross... We cannot have wisdom and understanding to live as God's people. This then leads us to another particular way in which God has blessed us. In verses 9 through 10, there, Paul tells us that God has also made known to us, made known to us in all wisdom and understanding and insight or understanding the mystery of His will. For the future. It concerns his purpose, 
which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time. For history is neither meaningless nor purposeless. It's moving towards a glorious goal. What then is this mystery that God has made known? This revealed secret, this will or purpose or plan of His? Well, chapter 3, in, in chapter 3, the mystery is the inclusion of the Gentiles in God's new society on equal terms with Jews. But this present ethnic unity is a symbol or a foretaste of a future unity that will be more, much more greater and more wonderful still. God's plan for the fullness of times when time merges into eternity again is to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. And so we as believers, if you're a born-again believer, a born-again Christian, are part of God's inner circle. You are part of God's inner circle. We are able to share in the secret that one day, one day, and I hope it's soon, God will unite everything, everything in Christ. Ever since sin came into the world, you see it? Things have been falling apart. First, man was separated from God. As, we read, as it says in Genesis chapter 3, then man was separated from man when Cain killed Abel in Genesis chapter 4. People tried to maintain a kind of unity by building a Tower of Babel there in Genesis chapter 11. But God judged them and scattered them throughout the world. God called Abraham and put a difference between Jew and Gentile, a difference that has that was maintained until Christ's death on the cross. So you see, sin, sin is tearing everything apart. But in Christ, God will gather everything together in the culmination of the ages. See, church, and here's what ought to blow your mind. I know it blows my mind. We are part of this great eternal program. You all are part of this great eternal program. Well, after describing the spiritual blessings which God gives to his people in Christ, Paul adds a further paragraph to emphasize the blessings, that the blessings belong equally to Jewish and Gentile believers. So let's pick up there in verse 11. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. In him we have also received an inheritance. Because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will. So that we, who had already put our hope in Christ, might bring praise to his glory. Church, in Christ, believers have a wonderful inheritance. And in Christ... We are that inheritance. We are valuable to him. Think about it. Think of the price God paid to purchase us, to redeem us, to make us part of his inheritance. God the Son is the Father's love gift to us. And we are the Father's love gift to his son. Can you repeat that wonderful, wonderful saying again? God is, God the Son is the Father's love gift to us. 
and we are the Father's love gift to His Son. Read John 17 and note how many times Christ calls us those who you've given me. Ephesians chapter, uh, when we get down to chapter 20, or verse 22 here in chapter 1, the church is Christ's body, building and bride. Christ's future inheritance is wrapped in the church. Romans 8.17 tells us that we are joint heirs with Christ, which means which means this, church, which means that he cannot claim his inheritance apart from us. Go hand in hand. At the end of verse 12, Paul once again reminds us that the end of our salvation is that we would be, we would be to the praise, we would, we would be to the praise of God's glory. Now, there are two important things that I want to point out and I want to, to, that we ought to note here about what it says there at the end of verse 12. First, salvation is first and foremost about God's glory, not about us. We are so man-centered that we mistakenly think that salvation is all about us. Thank God salvation does rescue us from his awful judgment and give us eternal life in heaven. But we need to understand that it's primarily, primarily about his glory. See, brothers and sisters in Christ, he saves us by his sovereign grace so that we will be to the praise of his glory. Do you understand that he owed us nothing but judgment? But he gave us infinite love and mercy. Even if we suffer terribly in this life, we can only praise and glorify him for his sovereign grace. And the second thing to note is the test of sound doctrine with regard to salvation is that it gives all glory to God and none to us. Now, there are those who simply emphasize our free will as if we had the power, all the power to choose, which they say we can exercise apart from God's gracious intervention, but that undermines God's grace and glory to just emphasize only free will. Martin Lloyd-Jones wrote this, In every view of salvation, the place is given in it to the glory of God. In every view of salvation, the place given in it to the glory of God provides the ultimate test the proof that is truly spiritual the proof that it is truly spiritual is that it gives all the glory to god as we just sang it's not about us it's all about jesus because of that because of what he did can we ought to give him the praise and the glory that he deserves Once again, let me remind you that we deserved the full punishment of our sins. But if you're sitting here today as a born-again believer, that wrath is no longer there. It's all because of what Christ did on the cross. We've been redeemed. We've been forgiven in Christ God's spiritual blessings for believers are based not only on the sovereign election of the Father and the redemptive work of the Son, 
But, but as we're about to read, also on the seal of the Holy Spirit. So let's read that last part of our passage this morning. Verse 13. Again, it begins with in him, and again, the speaking of Christ. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you also believed, were sealed in him with the promised Holy Spirit. He is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Here, Paul now switches from believers who had been born Jews to now those who had been born Gentiles. The phrase, in him, you also, refers to Gentiles in contrast to the Jews, which he previously spoke to. When they heard the word of truth, which is further described as the gospel of your salvation, and believed they were sealed with the promise, with the promised Holy Spirit. Let me rephrase that verse so it's more personal to you. When you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed you were sealed, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. The last part of verse 13 is literally, they were sealed in him with the spirit of promise. The word seal indicates security. Now listen carefully about what this word seal means or what it indicates. Security, authentication and approval, certification of genuineness, and identification of ownership. You see, God is the one who seals. Christ is the sphere in which the seal is done. And the Holy Spirit, my friends, is the instrument of that seal. The promised Holy Spirit refers to Christ's promise to his disciples that he would send the Spirit. There in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Now the Holy Spirit who seals Holy Spirit who seals, guess what? It's the down payment. It's the down payment of our inheritance. This down payment is more than a pledge which could be returned. It's a guarantee of more to come. A guarantee of more to come. In other words, it guarantees believers. It guarantees born-again believers inheritance of salvation and heaven. In essence, the down payment of the Holy Spirit, you know what it really is? It's just a, a little bit, a little bit of heaven, a taste of heaven in, in a believer's life with a guarantee of much more to come. I love that phrase, the best is yet to come, because yes, my friends, the best is yet to come. I know, but I know there's many who are suffering in many different ways. And you just want that suffering to, to end. You're like, why me? Why, why is this happening to me? Lord, just take it away. Keep in mind, whatever storm you're in right now, whatever desert you're in right now, if you're feeling uncertainty, if you're feeling scared, if you're feeling overwhelmed, anxious, just remember, Christ is in the boat with you. 
Jesus is in a boat with you. He's there. He may seem like he's sleeping or napping or taking a siesta, but he's in control. He's there. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. He knows that the storm will pass. You just have to maintain the course. He will get you through those storms, through those deserts, through those valleys. Don't lose hope. Don't lose faith. You are in God's possession. We're told in verse 12 that the believer is sealed with the Holy Spirit until the redemption of those who are in God's possession. Just to clarify, this redemption is not released from the guilt of sin. That was spoken of in verse 7. See, the believer is already God's possession. Instead, this is the believer's ultimate, final release from the presence of sin. From the presence of sin. Again, the phrase at the end there, to the praise of His glory is repeated here as it was in our previous passages, I believe, of verse 6. Yes, verse 6 and verse 12. So how should we respond? How should you respond to the security of God's seal and pledge? The end of Verse 13, to the praise of His glory. Paul especially wants his Gentile readers to know they can now enjoy equal standing in Christ before God alongside Jewish believers. There is no difference. Another commentator, F.F. Bruce, he puts it this way. In such language should now be applied to Gentile believers is a token of the security of their new standing within the community of God's own people, fully sharing present blessing and future hope with their fellow believers of Jewish stock. He goes on to point that Paul is, Paul here is echoing the words of Isaiah chapter 43, verses 20 and 21, where God says, My chosen people the people whom I formed for myself will declare my praise. For 2,000 years, for 2,000 years, the Gentiles were for the most part excluded from God's promises to Israel. But now, as Paul goes on to argue, we'll go on to argue in chapters 2 and 3, The Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. This, that alone, should cause everyone, every believer, every born-again Christian to praise and glorify God's name. Now, start wrapping this up by mentioning this, that throughout verses 3 and 14, we examined a number of basic Bible doctrines there in those verses, all on the theme of our riches in Christ. So it would be profitable for us to review what these verses teach us. Number one, true riches come from God. It is a source of great encouragement to all that know the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That they, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are all working on your behalf to make you rich. God not only gives us richly all things to enjoy, as Paul wrote Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, but he gives us eternal riches without which all other wealth 
is valueless. He gives, us, he gives us eternal riches without which all other wealth is valueless. A distraught wife sought a Christian marriage counselor and told her, told her sad story of, a mar- of her marriage that, that was about to dissolve. But we have so much, she kept saying. Look at this diamond on my finger. Why, it's worth a thousand why, it's worth thousands. We have an expensive mansion in an exclusive area. We have three cars and even a cabin in the mountains. Why, we have everything that money could buy. The counselor replied, it's good to have the things money can buy provided you don't lose the things that money can't buy. What good is an expensive house if there's no home? Or an expensive ring if there's no love? See, friends, in Christ, you and I have what money can't buy. These spiritual riches open up to us, to us all, the wealth of God's vast creation. We enjoy the gifts because we know and love the giver. Lavish in them. Enjoy these gifts, these blessings that you've been given. God wants you to enjoy them. Again, this should make your soul, your spirit shout with joy and praise. You've been redeemed, you've been forgiven, you've been sealed. You're blessed in so many ways. Stop looking at just the material things that people have. But share. It's important to, to share that news. Share that good news. Share what you've been given. It's not meant for you to keep to yourself. It's meant to be shared and be told to those who are lost especially those you love and care about, really cared about them, you're going to want to tell them the good news about Jesus so that they won't go to hell. If it's that serious to you, if it's that real to you, if redemption is real to you, and what Christ did on the cross is real, then why would you want that person you're living next to or you're living with or you're dating or that you really care about, why would you want them to go down in that direction of, of hell, complete separation from God? No, that should inspire you. That should inspire each and every one of you or you as a believer to want to share the good news about Jesus to those who are on the path to destruction. Number two, all of these riches come by God, come by God's grace and for God's glory. Did you notice that after each of the main sections that we read, that we covered there in verses 7 through 14, Paul has added the purpose behind these gifts, behind these blessings. So why has God the Father chosen us, adopted us, and accepted us to the, to the praise of the glory of His grace? Why has the Son redeemed us, forgiven us, revealed God's will to us, and made us part of His, of his inheritance? That we should be the praise of His glory. Why has God the Spirit sealed us and become the guarantee of our future blessing? Unto His praise and glory. Folks, we often have the idea that God saves sinners mainly because He pities them or wants 
to rescue them from eternal judgment. But listen carefully. God's main purpose, God's main purpose is that He may be glorified. His creation reveals His wisdom and power. But His church, us, all believers worldwide, reveals His love and grace. You cannot deserve or earn these spiritual riches. You can only receive them by grace through faith. You can only receive them by grace through faith. And then number three, these riches, these spiritual riches, these blessings, they're only the beginning. There's always more spiritual wealth to claim from the Lord as you walk with Him. The Bible is your guidebook. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. As you search the Word of God, you discover more and more the riches you have in Christ. These riches were planned by the Father. They were planned by the Father, purchased by the Son, and presented by the Holy Spirit. Really is no need for us to live in poverty when all of God's wealth is at our disposal. I read the story where a guy was discussing money matters with his wife and neither of them realized that their little son was listening. Finally, the boy broke in with the suggestion, why don't you just write one of those pieces of paper? Junior, little kid, didn't understand that it was necessary to have money in the bank to back up those pieces of paper. But we never face the problem when it comes to we never face that problem when it comes to our spiritual wealth. In a little devotional book by Charles Spurgeon titled A Checkbook on the Bank of Faith, a promise from the Bible was given for each day of the year, along with a short devotional message. There Spurgeon described each promise as being as good as money in the bank to anyone who would claim it by faith. Same way a person would write a check against his bank account. So you see, by faith, you can claim God's promises and draw on his limited, limitless wealth to meet every need you may face. See, church, God had a plan of salvation laid out here in these first four, in verses 3 to 14. And that plan included Him, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is found right there in verses 3 to 14. There's no denying it. If you've trusted in Christ as Savior, Guess what? God gave you His Holy Spirit as a seal and pledge of your inheritance so that you will praise and glorify Him. In other words, you will not praise and glorify God properly unless, unless you feel secure in His eternal love that saved you from your sin and sealed you for His own possession. Now, since the chief end of man and another way of saying the purpose of man, if you ever wondered, ask that question, or someone has asked you, hey, what is the purpose of man? What is the chief end of man? Well, again, we're told here in these verses, it's to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. When you do that, you will feel secure in the salvation that He has given you so that you will fulfill that purpose. So again, brothers and sisters in Christ, unwrap, 
the present. Unwrap the gift. And revel in it. Just enjoy it. Soak in it. Soak, revel in the gift, in God's gift of the Holy Spirit who secures your salvation. Some of you maybe don't have that security if you want this morning to to be redeemed. You want your sins to be forgiven. You want to be sealed. Be sealed by the Holy Spirit. I want to invite you to the cross where you can lay your sins there and, and have Jesus take them from you. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of you, all of us have sinned. But you can be forgiven today of those sins. So if that's what you'd like to do, I want you to, if you've never prayed before, I want to invite you to the cross and lead you in a prayer to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. So wherever, wherever you're at, with all sincerity, as your eyes are closed and your heads are bowed, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And right now, I, I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me of all my sins. I believe that you died for my sins and three days later, you rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins. I now turn from my sins and confess you <clears throat> and you alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. So now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you watch this, if you're watching this message or listening to it and you prayed that prayer, let me be first to tell you man, you've been redeemed, you've been forgiven, and you've been sealed. If you need help in your next steps on what, where you ought to do or where you ought to go or uh, contact us, we can help you with that. Um, Maybe help you find a church or uh, in your location or maybe just pray with you. But we want to hear from you. Let us know your story and how you, uh, how you came to, to hear this message and how it changed your life. Brothers and sisters in Christ, those of you watching, again, just never forget that. Always have that in the forefront of your mind spiritual blessings that you have in Christ, the riches that you have in Christ, that God has given you, that is bestowed, that He's lavished on you, that He's poured out on you. And when you remember that and when you, that comes to mind, glorify God. Praise God for all that He's done for you. I hope all of you have, those watching, I hope all of you have a great week. Be a blessing to others. And we will see you and talk to you next week. Thank you. Goodbye. We love you. 
Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.